During the mission Regret in Halo 2, we get this absolutely beautiful scene of High Charity coming out of slip space, accompanied by what Cortana calls the largest Covenant Armada anybody has ever seen. This time, instead of one of the smallest name fleets in all of the Covenant, we are going to throw essentially the biggest, because High Charity and her escorts included the second fleet of homogeneous clarity. And during the Ninth Age of Reclamation, this was the largest Covenant fleet, and it was turned from offensive duties over to defensive duties, becoming the Praetorians and Vanguard to the true seat of power to the Covenant. Starting in the usual fashion with the quickest of the scenarios, we have the Eldari. There's just no winning. You couldn't convince all of the craft worlds to show up at one spot, and even if all of the Eldari were there, there's just no winning. Scenario 2, we have the High Charity Defense Fleet, pops into Tyranid controlled space. I do think in this instance the Covenant would actually do really well. They have experience fighting a watered down version of the Nids where they come from, and as well have technology only really on the level of the Necrons. In a best case scenario, I can see the initial High Fleet or Tendril retreating, but they won't give up on such a delicacy. The Tyranids would adapt and probe the Covenant Fleet, by the third or fourth serious attempt, the Tyranids would win. Covey Tech is advanced and all, but there's not much you can do against an uncountable number of bugs. And we know from fighting the various races of the 40k galaxy that they have adapted to every tactic and weapon set against them. Also, this would be the second time Mendicant Bias would be forced to commune with an all-powerful intelligence. So for Scenario 3, we are going to have them pop into the Sautech Dynasty space. It's realistically going to be the same no matter what dynasty gets hit. Even a minor dynasty is going to be more than capable of pushing back anything short of the Forerunners. And while we're on the topic of the Forerunners, we may as well mention that the Necrons essentially have the same weaponry that the Forerunners have. They have some equivalent of Atomizer or Molecular Destabilizer, I'm not sure. It just essentially rips you apart at a molecular level. Now, that's not to say the Covenant weaponry isn't powerful. They are still going to be punching solid fist-size holes in objects, but it's nothing compared to getting shot in the shoulder and suddenly you're a pile of ash. Not only that, but the Necrons would actually be able to reverse engineer Forerunner tech and use it at the level of the Forerunners, not at the level of the San Shayun or whatever race is commandeering it. The Necrons would be able to fully implement Forerunner tech and reproduce it on a mass scale. Granted, it's probably going to be held by that one dynasty, but still, the Necrons would have it at that point. And since for this scenario, I decided to give it to the Sautech dynasty, the Sautech dynasty would go from the maybe strongest dynasty to, without a doubt, the single strongest dynasty. And lastly, Emotech would have Mendicant Bias. Whether Mendicant Bias is able to overpower Necron coding is not really what I want to discuss, but it's a nice way to really wrap this narrative up. Either Emotech or Mendicant Bias would own the entire galaxy. Scenario 4 has us being dropped off somewhere in orc-controlled space. I wasn't sure what planet exactly, but we'll just put them anywhere the orcs are. Any ground combat is guaranteed to produce a WA. Elites and Brutes are going to be way too fun of an opponent for the orcs to pass up, and I think both sides are going to just get lost in the sauce, but I'm pretty sure as soon as the Prophets realize that they're essentially mushroom people who put off spores, they are going to glass the planet. Whatever planet it is, whatever system it is, it is going to be glassed. And this isn't like when the Imperium goes around with its flamers and attempts to clean up all the spores. No, there would be no spores. I'm also not quite sure how the Covenant would react to Space Hulks. I think maybe the first couple of them they would think that they're just floating debris, but after the third or fourth they're not gonna fall for it, and Void Combat would very quickly be off the table. I think a really good spot to end this narrative is with a group of elites and brutes just leaving the Covenant entirely to go on this big ol' scrap with the orcs. For situation 4, we have the Tau, and there isn't really a situation where the Tau can win here. High Charity popping into Tau space with nearly 10,000 ships is a death sentence for the Blue Bovine Boys. Given the benefit of the doubt, let's say they pop into the most important sept, Tau itself. Now, unlike the orcs who would try and engage in ground melees, or attempt to essentially just ram them with a meteoroid, the Tau would engage in heavily mechanized warfare, focusing mainly on hit and run tactics. Yes, the Covenant have remarkable technology, but when there's hundreds of mechs cutting across the battlefield flashing in and out of target range, you can't really use conventional forces. Also, this is about the time when the Covenant would encounter humans among the race of the moving monstrosities. 
As soon as a human auxiliary was spotted, news would quickly spread to the prophets and a full commitment to eradicating this empire would be put in order. The Covenant also would have no way of knowing that this wasn't the same humans that they had encountered in their own galaxy, since immediately they wouldn't know that they're in a different galaxy, they would just know that they are essentially just getting shot at, and then there are humans here. So they would probably just assume that this is some far-flung outpost somewhere that the humans had set up and commit to glassing. Subsequently, I can see every single human within the Tau Empire being killed, and if the Ethereals actually decide to use their head for once, they could essentially manipulate the Covenant into believing that they were at the mercy of their human overlords. That is realistically their only option here, since if they admit to allowing humans within the ranks of the Tau Empire, they would just be wiped off the map and the Coveys would have a few more client species. It's kinda beautiful to think that a best case scenario for the Tau are they are forced into the Covenant and there's finally somebody below the grunts. Weirdly enough, I think the crew would do extremely well in this situation, fitting somewhere in between Jackals and Skirmishers, light infantry that could fit the role of a Jackal while also being able to pack a punch like an Elite. We also have to consider industry. If the crew, or some blue boys, get absorbed into the Covenant, then we have a situation where the Covenant is essentially given the keys to a minor galactic empire. Dozens of systems worth of manpower and materiel would just be handed to them, which, granted how adept at industrial production the Covenant actually is, would mean that if the Inquisition or some other faction doesn't pay very close attention to them, they would quickly become public enemy number two, because even the Coveys are nothing compared to the Bugs. This would also be one of those weird situations where nothing really changes for the Imperium, except the Tau just get a big technology boost, because the Tau are already the Walmart brand Covenant, or maybe it's the other way around, I'm not sure. So for the Imperium versus High Charity, I'm going to break this down into some sub-scenarios since I had a lot of fun theory of these. So for 6A, we have High Charity and her defense fleet pops up in the Sol system, specifically in the outer solar system near the Orc Cloud. Now, unlike part 1 where the fleet would be wiped out with minor casualties or lost in material, the High Charity defense fleet would be comparable to the fleet brought by the Rangda during the second Rangda Crusade or Xenocide. Very quickly, the Prophet of Truth and the other High Prophets would recognize the Sol system and begin a brutal campaign of slaughter. Battlefleet Solar would immediately engage and the entire Battlefleet would be lost defending the Jovian or Saturnine subsystems. Pluto, Ass Planet, and Neptune, and realistically a large part of the Jovian moons, would all be scoured by the time any additional defenses could be mustered. Every major Battlefleet in Astartes chapter are immediately called to Terra for defense. But this is where the fun starts. All this chaos and confusion would mean that every single astropathic choir and every psyker would be strained to their absolute limits. And if the planet of Prospero had a warp rift appear in their skies due to psychic backlash, the entire soul system would become one giant warp rift as every available psyker combined their might to either give their power to the Emperor or to erect some sort of psychic barrier. We also know that High Charity fell to the Flood in a matter of hours, but to demons, I wouldn't even give High Charity a single hour, 60 minutes maximum. Every Covenant race has some aspect of chaos, we'd have some fun new demon princes, and maybe we would get a Sangheili demon prince, or maybe Atriox ascends to the Chaos Prince of Corn. a lot of really fun stuff, and I'm not even going to speculate on the psychic potential of any races within the Covenant, since psychic powers only exist for the precursors of the Flood, and that isn't even real psychic power. They just essentially rearrange the living material of the universe, so Psyker powers would be a hard counter to the Coveys. But the sheer chaos caused by the invasion of the Soul System creates a massive warp rift and demon hell. The Covenant would definitely lose here since this would be their first contact with real demons and gods, and I really don't want to get into the weeds of it, but essentially we would have just like a big reset to essentially before the Emperor came around, or before the collapse of the Human Federation. And basically you'd have a situation where there's a ton of pocket human empires who each are trying to do their own thing, and we're not even sure if they're going to be able to unify the whole species, or the galaxy for that matter. Moving over to 6B, we have High Charity and her defense fleet pops up in the same spot near the Orc Cloud. Now, the astute among you may have noticed that I didn't include Mendicant Bias in the last sub-scenario at all. But rest assured, this is the Cybernetic Revolt 2 Electric Boogaloo. 
As soon as the shard of Mendicant Bias that's within High Charity made contact with any human network, the Contender Class AI would immediately begin his Penitent Crusade. Within mere minutes of being in system, every single ship, every single machine, every single tech priest, anything with a central processor is commandeered by Mendicant. 100,000 years of contemplation and self-doubt would be released upon the Covenant as technology sealed away in the deepest dungeons of the Imperial Palace and the Vault of Mars come alive. Archaeotech, thought lost, or technology that has just been generally misused or left dormant for millennia would suddenly wake up and begin functioning like they never slept to begin with. All the while, every piece of armor and every cybernetic beings are paralyzed or locked in place as Mendicant did what he believed was best for humanity. I imagine that our boy MB would send the Covenant to a far corner of the solar system where they could then be boarded by Men of Iron and other abominable intelligences that have been hiding from the prying eyes of the Mechanicum for millennia. Once the Covenant forces had been subdued, which realistically would take less than a couple hours for a contender class AI, it's up in the air what happens. Either all of the humans and whatever passes for humans in the 42nd millennium would be terrified of the AI that showed up on a hostile fleet and slaughtered or enslaved those who brought it here, there just isn't really a situation where the Imperium isn't disgusted by AI, so doing the next best thing Mendicant Bias sends the majority of the Covenant fleet into a parking position over Mars where they are powered down and left for the humans to salvage and attempt to reverse engineer. If you thought the situation was cracked out before, buckle up, because I'd wager a solid portion of the Mechanicus would do everything in their power to follow Mendicant Bias. To a lot of the tech priests, Mendicant is the closest thing to an Omnissiah that they will have ever actually seen. This would essentially cause a civil war within the Mechanicum, and we'd get another split like we did with the Dark Mechanicus, but this time, instead of being just, you know, an important world, it is Holy Mars. Where that goes is up to you guys, but the real fun is when Mendicant Bias takes over the body of Belisarius Call and happens to wipe his memory with the excuse of being too full, then Mendicant slowly influences the genetic and technological advances of humanity until he can safely reveal himself again. So this isn't even like a Covenant or the Imperium wins, it's just, I don't know, they showed up and left draw I guess? No, it, it's still a win because they get technology and resources out of it, so yeah. Strange Imperial victory. We're going to end this off with the last sub-scenario, and it's arguably the shortest. Hundreds of Covenant ships pop up in front of Terra, just like we saw in Halo 2, except instead of on Installation 05, it's the skies of Terra. Hundreds of Covenant ships would immediately be obliterated, as every defense platform and an escort ship in system immediately converge on the trespassers. Battlefleet Solar, however formidable in the 42nd millennium, does not stand a chance against 10,000 ships that outclass the Imperium in almost every way. Since in this scenario High Charity popped up so close to Terra, we don't have the issue of running fleet battles cutting into the inner solar system. The entire Covenant fleet would be in range of Terra and would absolutely atomize the planet. There just isn't a situation where the Imperium wins decisively quickly enough. Either Psykers cause a warp rift or Terra is glassed, but that's honestly where the funny part of this scenario begins. As the Covenant are glassing Terra, the Talisman of Vulcan that's fashioned of the Golden Throne would absolutely obliterate the Covenant fleet. The entire soul system would be wiped off from the map, and the only thing surviving would be maybe the Void Dragon Shard within Mars, but I'm not certain of that. The saddest part of this scenario is that Mendicant Bias doesn't get a chance to redeem himself. The Imperium, or whatever does survive, as McCrag would become the new capital of the Imperium, poor rubber boot Gorilla Glue just can't catch a break. Not only does he have to try and duct tape the Imperium back together, but now the Imperium, for all intents and purposes, just doesn't exist. Gilliman would be forced to be the Emperor of Imperium Secundus, or the Lion, but I don't think Girly Man would allow the Lion to actually take the Emperor's spot. If you made it this far, thank you. I, uh, I genuinely appreciate the support you guys show on these videos. I made a Discord server for the channel, I'm gonna put it in the links below. I really want to organize that Stellaris community game. I think that would be a really fun event to do for like 1k or 2k. Either way, thank you guys for watching. I hope you all have a good weekend or good rest of your day or whatever it is.